All right, hello everyone. What's up? I'm Max without a spec guide, being filmed by my colleague Ryan, driving my Polestar 2, but I'm making a video that's gonna apply to any electric car. Tesla, Polestar, Rivian, Ford mach -E, Lightning, you name it. There's lots of electric cars out there, and something that I think is super interesting we don't talk about a lot is the fact that almost every automaker has a slightly different strategy towards regenerative braking. And as a quick primer, what is regenerative braking? Well, it's really cool as a technology. It's what allows you to basically uh, roll motors backwards and create an opposite effect. Normally, we put electricity into motors. It makes them spin, the rotor part of the motor, the part that moves, and you move forward. With the regenerative braking, you take the heat energy from rolling backward, you, make, uh, you have an electromagnetic field that basically puts charge back in the battery. It's really cool as technology, but we've got some more nerdy explaining to do about it and a lot of surprising differences between every automaker you need to know about. So stay tuned and keep watching. All right, so what are the big things to get across with regen? I briefly explained the concept, right? Not only is this cool as just a nerdy perspective of efficiency, it's also cool in that it saves a lot of wear and tear on your friction brake pads, which in an electric car normally would be tasked with a lot given that a lot of electric cars are fairly quick to accelerate and are quite heavy because of all the batteries and components they have. So it's all very honestly, you know, it's a lot to do for your brakes. So it's great to give them a load off. However, different automakers do things very differently. Let's start with Tesla, the 9,000 pound gorilla in the room. Tesla has an extremely interesting strategy where they kind of, uh, maybe not pioneered, but really I would argue mainstream what we know is one pedal driving. One pedal driving is a terminology you may have heard people talk about, and it's essentially what I have in cars like my Polestar or Ryan would have in his Tesla Model 3. I lift off the accelerator, the car is going to slow to a stop and just hold itself there eventually. Uh, the idea being that in normal traffic conditions with anticipation, even on the highway, you can essentially just use the accelerator, modulating it down or up, releasing it. You of course have the brakes there when you need them. The difference that Tesla has is many automakers, since the, like, the dawn of the modern electric cars we know it, like literally going back to GM EV1, if you really want to be a throwback, have done what's called brake blending, where they use really interestingly engineered and honestly quite complicated systems to, when you press the brake pedal, apply a little bit of regenerative braking, basically use the motors to brake first, and then as you need, let's say, more than like 0.2 G of force or whatever the braking force is that's required, you need the bigger brake it'll step up friction, but it has to blend those in all into one brake pedal, making it seamless to the user. Different brands, I would argue, do this to differing degrees of success. Mercedes has what they call, I think it's like a dynamic brake pedal, and it is, to put it nicely, extremely controversial. The brake pedal, to tell you that it's doing regen when you're in one pedal, will actually move further away from you, and many drivers, including myself, find this extremely disconcerting. Other brands, like Tesla, I would argue, uh, have an interesting approach because they don't do any brake blending. So what Tesla does is they have one pedal, you lift off the accelerator, the car does slow down, but when you hit the brakes, they want to keep the brake feel consistent. Their argument is, look, the pedal is the same no matter what, um, behaves just like a normal friction brake. And that's their excuse. The, another reason they do it is simply cost and engineering complexity. It simplifies their cars a lot to doing this, and I don't need to get too much into the nerdy details, but it's one of many things that lets Tesla basically enjoy um, more efficient, optimized vehicles. It's just one of those kind of interesting strategies they've decided on. Almost every other automaker, with the exception, I believe, of Lucid, disagrees with Tesla on this and does brake blending. So the thing to know as a user is that your car will probably have some kind of display of power output and power input. So if Ryan, my cameraman, goes in on my Polestar screen, you can see that I have basically this bar here uh, where when I jump on the pedal a bit, it goes in the orange zone. When I release and regen happens, it goes way into the gray zone, whatever you want to call that color, light blue. Uh, so some cars, like uh, Ryan's former car, actually the Chevy Bolt, will I think really helpfully tell you the exact kilowatt amount of power you're currently outputting or inputting. Outputting being, right, putting it down, power down, getting that car to speed, input typically being regenerative braking, or of course charging at a DC fast charger for instance. Super helpful when you get those nerdy stats exposed to you, I personally like that. Not everyone needs it. Something I thought I should note. So one pedal, regen, brake blending, what does this all mean? Well, 
This is helping us typically just drive more efficiently, save our brakes, and get more range out of our electric cars. However, the more and more I looked into this issue, the more I realized it's not as simple as, well, honestly, I and a lot of people have been led to believe because the narrative around EVs in general, I remember like 2012, 2015, you know, early years of EVs, Tesla Model S, BMW i3, interesting experiments was EV enthusiasts, eggheads and nerds, people like me now, would say, you should use one pedal all the time. It's the most efficient. It's amazing. It's super great for traffic. It's super relaxing. And this is a compelling argument. I see why Tesla is so big on it. I see why early cars like the Nissan Leaf and the BMW i3 had one pedal modes. However, the more and more you talk to engineers of different car companies, and the more and more you think about the physics of this, the more and more you realize that one pedal isn't always the answer. Because let's say you're on a highway and you're using regen. So yes, regen's capturing your energy. Let's say you go from 70 to 60 because your foot slightly slips or you just change speed. You're capturing a little bit of that energy from slowing down, but not all of it. Thermodynamics, you're never gonna have 100% efficiency. There's always gonna be some losses. So it's not exactly like we're looking at a net zero situation. So anytime you're using regen, yes, you are capturing back some of the energy you would have lost ordinarily to just heating up your brake rotors, but you're not capturing all of it. Meaning that in highway situations, if you can coast, honestly do, pull start recommends officially that you turn off region on the highway, which is interesting, but keep it on in town. Now, I would argue if you're, you know, a nerd egghead like me, like I like to have very precise right foot control. I like my car to behave the same at all times, as many Tesla drivers also might like to. You can keep one pedal on all the time. It just does take a little bit of, I would argue, extra driver skill and engagement. Because if you've ever been in a car with, you, let's say, your friend who has a Tesla Model 3 or Model Y, and they're not a very good driver or their right foot isn't super sensitive, you might get to feel a little car sick because their right foot technique on the pedal might result in the car feeling jerky as it switches between regen and outputting power to the motors. It does, I would argue, take a driver some extra skill to keep that up. And it's a tension too. For long road trips, this is why I would argue it's really important that modern electric cars have good, at the very least, adaptive cruise control systems. Because when you use cruise control, well, the computer is always going to be pretty precise and pretty efficient with keeping you to speed, whereas your right foot, even for the best of us drivers, might not necessarily be. So I would say using cruise control in general is a good hack. However, if you do think that you really want to optimize your range hyper mile the most, yes, at high speeds, highway situations where you're not regularly stopping and going, maybe you should just turn one pedal off in your car if you can. In a Tesla, by the way, you can't do this. One other more big niggle with regen that I really want to mention is the fact that regen doesn't always work because from what I've described with regen to you, it charges the battery. Well, what if the battery is at such a high state of charge, it can't really take in current? Well, then we get an issue where regen is limited. Different cars have different methods of communicating this. On my Polestar, there'll be hatched out areas on the bar where my regen normally would be telling me that would be friction brakes. You can't see it now, but maybe I'll put a screenshot in so you can see what it looks like. Tesla communicates this as saying, you know, you may not have full regen ability. There's a green icon that flashes on screen on the driver display. That, I think, is a good approach. Some automakers don't expose this, which I think is dangerous. Other automakers have warnings. Let's take, for instance, the 9,000-pound GMC Hummer EV. Really impressive electric car, regardless of how you think of how sensible it is. Super impressive engineering accomplishment. That thing weighs a lot, like several tons, and it needs to slow down. GM actively says that if you have no region available, if you're at a high state of charge, and let's say you live at the top of a hill, you need to get down to the top of that hill, don't charge your car past 90% because they actually need regen to help the friction brakes. The friction brakes by themselves, according to GM, will not do enough to slow the car down. It's that big. Now, could they have sized up the brake rotors? Yes, they could have. We can always make things bigger, but sometimes automakers bank on regen so much that they kind of Funnily enough, with a Hummer EV, which doesn't seem like it should be an efficient vehicle, they actually do build in these efficiency considerations of, oh, well, where can we optimize and save cost? Because engineers love to do this. And so it's given them the opportunity to make the brakes smaller. Doesn't mean we're necessarily in a world yet where we can disregard brakes. Even Tesla has a toggle as of recent software updates. 
in winter conditions when temperatures are colder and you also have limited battery performance, meaning you can't generally brake as consistently. Tesla has a toggle now where you can turn on a behavior that will still keep the same one pedal effect even when the battery is super full or when temperatures are low. The way Tesla does this is they basically blend in the friction brakes. So it is sort of brake by wire, I guess. I don't know how technical you want to get about it, but basically it will on Model 3 and Y. Uh, and I think S and X and all their entire lineup now with the new software will simulate one pedal to the same effect, same kind of stopping force you would always expect as a driver. It'll just do that by virtue of friction brakes where it needs to fill in for regen. It's almost like we've come full circle. So basically, two ways to slow your car down in an electric car. The old way we're used to, good old brakes, hopefully hydraulic discs on every wheel, though not every car does that for cost reasons, but ideally some kind of calipers, brake pads, we're all used to those, and then regenerative braking by virtue of just those motors rolling backwards. Another interesting implementation, uh, so BMW and Porsche are two proponents of coasting when possible, it makes sense for different reasons. Porsche on their Taycan got a lot of flack for not having one pedal. On that car, you can very easily, with a steering wheel button, switch on more aggressive regeneration, uh, but it's not exactly one pedal. The car does not slow you down to a stop. Porsche would argue that this is for one, predictive consistent brake feel when you're on a track because apparently all Taycan owners go to the racetrack all the time and two because it um, is just more efficient which fair enough sometimes coasting makes a lot more sense. BMW super interestingly enough does um, a different kind of motor currently in their cars. This may change with their future motors but right now they believe it or not if you're an engineer this might blow your mind they use a brushed commutator AC synchronous motor, which if you've been following electric cars, a lot of them use permanent magnets. If you're not a nerd, ignore all this, but basically just know that what it means is BMW cars have a really interesting ability to coast by virtue of their motor design. Now, the issue with brushed motors is I don't know how BMW cars will work in the long term with motor maintenance because typically, especially when you're regenerating, you'd think that would cause more wear and tear on components, but this is all speculation. What BMW says is the advantage here with their cars, this would apply to iX, i4, I believe i7, basically their current crop of electric, fully electric battery cars, is that they'll get more efficiency on the highway. And real world numbers actually do bear this out. Kyle was super impressed with the efficiency of the BMW iX, and I suspect a lot of that might have to do with this coasting behavior, where the motor can really have basically no drag when it wants to coast at highway speed. That is a super cool thing, specifically applies to BMW cars, but it's something I thought I would mention for those of you who might be considering one of those. One more niggle, actually, sorry, before I leave you off. Different electric cars come in different configurations in terms of drive type, just like gas cars. You're familiar with front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, and four wheel drive or all wheel drive, depending on how the transfer case works in a gas car. In an electric car, same thing. Typically, motors are packaged per axle. So we have a motor on the front or a motor on the rear or dual motors and many electric cars to provide all wheel drive, higher performance, more traction. Well, regen is super interesting because to enable regen, yes, you can think about it, you need a motor, right? You can't do a regen without a motor. So only the axle that has a motor can do regen. So in a car like Ryan's Model 3, because it's rear wheel drive, the car does have to use only regen on the rear axle. Now, that doesn't mean the car is a trail braking mess. Tesla's really smart about software. They're really smart about ABS and all these systems, and they optimize the crap out of them. So the motor controller is not gonna send you, you know, skidding your tires out. However, just something interesting to note, and something you should know about. Typically, cars that have a motor in front, if they're front wheel drive based or dual motor, and are able to use region on the front, can recapture more energy, because if you think about it, when you're braking, your car shifts forward, more of your mass is over the front axle, it's more ideal to brake forward first, uh, or get mo most of your energy from the front. It's all about mixing in the front and rear, but this is just one more benefit of dual motor electric vehicles. That said, there's also efficiency downsides to this that we can get into in other videos, but that's a nerdy topic for another day. I hope I've done a decent job of explaining regen to you, how it might work in different cars, and just be used to expecting different implementations. Hyundai, for instance, has panels that you can shift. I think Kia cars do this too, as do Genesis, where you can change the regen mode, and by default, they actually don't put you in one pedal for 
the reason I mentioned earlier. It's not always the most efficient. So different cars force you to think differently about this. Be ready to adapt your brain. Think about what's happening. Hopefully I've armed you with the knowledge to be more successful in that area, but please do comment if you think I've got something wrong or your vehicle behaves differently. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Edit Spec Guide. I'll see you next time.